I was orchestral gonna music. You're going to read a poem? I was. You, you can still read a poem. I don't know how the algorithm is going to respond to a poem, but... Algorithms are anti-poetical? Hmm. Kind of by definition. Really? <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose so. <laughs> Are you ready? So, I'm ready. For another episode of Classical, Classical Rebellion. Rebellion. I think we should add the singing every time. All right. Classical, Classical Rebellion. Rebellion. <laughs> okay. Today. This is so you know that we know what we're to doing and we're, we're, we're serious. We are. We have resonance. We do. Yep. Now we just have to develop relevance. Relevance. Well, I think we're relevant. <laughs> yeah. We have to develop an audience, which leads us to the thing we always forget. The number one thing you can do right now to support the arts is... Is to... Subscribe. Smash that button. John's into smashing. You smash it. He's like Hulk. Hulk. Smash the button. Hulk smash. Like and... Subscribe. Subscribe. Like and subscribe. Do it. Just do it. And Don't then, worry about it later. We're not going to bug you. Just do it. And then share... With your friends, send it as a link, maybe yeah. in an email, and say, look, look at these two idiots. I mean, it would be really look at these nice. these guys. Everybody these needs to hear a couple of idiots, you these know, rambling Pagliacci. on now, again, now and again. Yeah. It's not like we don't have experience at what we're talking about. We've got yeah, tons. We've got some experience. We've got some experience. And we're willing to share it. So yes. that's worth something. So two major op uh, issues or obstacles... Maybe obstacles that I see in opera, specifically, but one of them is also in orchestral music. And that one that they both share is audience development. <laughs> it just, it has to be done, but no one is really doing it. Maybe some are, and I just don't know about it. That's really what we're trying to do here, is audience development. We're trying to help people who would become audience members of classical music or opera have some vocabulary and grammar to take with them to the concert so that they enjoy it more. I, uh, so audience development is one big issue. And for opera, Reggie Theater. <laughs> or Reggie Teatre. Reggie Teatre. Director's Theater. Oh. And that, I'll give you a little definition here from the old Wikipedia. That's death. Is German for Director's Theater. Is the modern practice of allowing a director freedom in devising the way a given opera or play is staged so that the creator's original specific intentions or stage directions where supplied can be changed together with major elements of geographical location chronological situation casting and plot typically such changes may be made to point a particular political point or modern parallels, which may be remote from traditional interpretations. Yeah, That's in other words, a problem. Can I say this? Uh, but no, just say BS. How'd you know what I was going to say? I because you asked permission. You were going to use a a word that gets the what's it, we're, we're slaves to the algorithm. <laughs> what do they not like the word masturbation? Oh, that's fine. Yeah, directorial masturbation. That's all that is. Yeah. That's what that is. And it is the death of opera. Directors should not be free. They should be in prison. Say it, John. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I think. Artistic prison. They should be in an artistic prison. They should be required to be... If they are slaves to anything, it should be to the composer's intentions. Yes. This read... Re okay, let me give you a, the, the best example of Regio Theater that I know. And I was there, I saw it, I paid money for it, oh, okay. and I felt violated afterwards. <laughs> okay, so San Diego Opera was doing Rigoletto. Oh, this, this one. Was I was in this one. a number of years ago. I was and, in this one. And the director had got, taken the play of Rigoletto, you know, the, the, the jester, who jests at everyone's misfortune, and then when his daughter is abducted by the duke, he gets, he feels really hard done by, you know, and yep. ends up 
it, it his plan to rescue her ends up calling costing her his, her life and and he's left it's a weeping. mess it's a real mess right but it's a, it's a tragedy and it's a great story well they had taken this from the court of mantua in the mantua 13th right? century something like that so. the du- the duchy of mantua which means it has a duke yeah right to Hollywood in the 1980s. And the Duke of Mantua became Duke Mantua, film producer. Right. And and in in the... I think Rigoletto was an agent. Yeah, I mean, and so they're... But this is is great. You're going to love this. So they're at Duke's house in the prologue, in the prelude, and they're all watching a film, Duke's latest film, and um, uh, there's a, a movie going on, and they're all standing around talking, watching this thing. And then uh, at some point, the bad guys pull into a, a, a car into a parking space, right into the nose, into the camera. And it's a great big Mercedes Benz, just pulls right in with the Mercedes Benz logo. The season sponsor was Audi. Oh, oh, oh. this is the greatest comeuppance <laughs> I good. ever saw for a stupid <laughs> idea of transposition. Okay, okay. So that's that's Regio Theater, and that's how it can bite you in the butt. <laughs> okay, so that production was originally done by L.A. Opera, whose season was probably sponsored by someone, probably by Mercedes, probably Mercedes. And the big draw here, the the big. The big reason for this existing was the director, the the one who who came up with this concept, was the director of Driving Miss Daisy, the movie. And so we were all supposed to be starstruck that this Hollywood director had, you know, come down and, and brought his genius to opera. It doesn't work that way. Movies are not opera, and operas are not movies. No. Your movie director, direct movies. Opera directors need to direct Opera. If you want to go see like something cinematic, go to a cinema. Yeah, it's not it works the same. Great. It's so good. Movies at the cinema are incredible. I, I remember. <laughs> yeah, they really do <laughs> really work good. that way. I, I've I seen remember, some good stuff. I remember years ago when Tito Capobianco, um, who was a very capable director, but we, I, I think it was actually Gwendolyn, which I mentioned in the last issue. We we had a scrim in front of the theater for uh, in front of the stage for the whole show there was a scrim and it was supposed to somehow make the presentation on stage look more two-dimensional and film-like like you're watching oh, a movie yes. well the last time i watched a movie all of the characters weren't that big <laughs> you know i mean right. good luck with a close-up yeah. yeah so i mean that's just silly yeah opera that is, you're on to something else that is a problem for opera and that it's lost its way. Opera, when it was most popular, say mid 20th century, 30s, 40s, 50s, it was opera. It wasn't trying to be the movies. It was trying to be opera, overtly trying to be opera. And those operas were set in the time and place that the composer and librettist designated because it, it makes sense. Now, wait, 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 you're looking for sense? I'm looking for okay. what's happening on stage to line up with what... I've seen so much nonsense, I've forgotten words that sense that was a com- factor. I'm looking for what's happening on stage to line up with the words that are coming out of the singer's mouths. <laughs> That's what I like. That's where I think you're opera is, is strong. So, But also, let's face facts. You don't go to an opera to see cinematic views. You go to be wowed by a vocal performance. And that's what it's about. That's what it's about. And, oh my goodness. Well, I'm afraid you're gonna get it anyway. All right, come on, kitty. Yeah. Um, That's what it's about. And that's where the emphasis has to be. And and to try to turn it into a novel, I mean, it's just that that wouldn't work now, would it? Right. So. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. 
You have a voice. You you are heard. <laughs> Old sushi here. It's all about the vocal performance. That's right. So anyway, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, uh, we've we've. I'm sure you've seen some egregious examples as well. Yeah, I have. My mind goes back to Boris Gudinov at the at Covent Garden, and the big spider above the stage that was supposed to be his <laughs> his his. his <laughs> His conscience or something that's oh. grasp it. Uh, oh, it, it was just so dumb. Yeah, that's... It, the audience were, like, tr- literally trying to keep from laughing. Everybody yeah. was just dumbstruck. You know what works with Boris? When he's the Tsar of Russia at a specific time. You think? That works. That yeah. does work, doesn't it? Yeah, especially with the Holy Fool, because that's tradition from that era of Russia. A significant one. A profound tradition, the Holy Fool. Yeah. And then, of course, and that's, there that's, was... That, uh, that's the, what the whole piece hinges on. And he says, Boris, kill these, kill, kill these kids who are making fun of you, me like you killed the, the, the little czar. Yeah. I saw Siegfried. Okay. With Siegfried Jerusalem at Covent Garden. And the whole set was cardboard boxes. And, <laughs> and Siegfried walked back and forth across the front of the stage in a trench in a trench coat, pretty much the whole opera. Huh. He just walked back and forth singing his part. It was the dumb, one of the dumbest things I've ever seen in my life. And cheap, a hundred percent cheap. Yeah. Talk about the emperor's new clothes. That's really what we're talking about. And it has, it has dealt deathly blows to opera all over the world. This kind of stupid, the, the, the stupid right. approach. The, the fact is, it's already opera, which isn't an easy sell to begin with anymore. When you add nonsense that confuses a new audience on top of that, well, who's ever coming back? That's the thing. Oh, we need to revive these these old, tired, operatic war horses. No, you're not. For you're who? Not. Apparently, from what you're saying, no one's seen these operas. What you you have don't to, have an audience anymore. What so you have to do is do them well. Do them well. As really they're intended, well. so the audience can understand it. Is that too much to ask? Apparently so. Now I've seen some good productions. Have I, you? The, yeah, the Meister Singer at the Met, fantastic. Set in Nuremberg, in the correct century. Oh, it was well, wonderful. Oh well, yeah. yeah. I thought you meant you'd seen some good regio theater. Oh no. Well, I don't know that I actually ever have. I I like the Willie Decker production of Traviata with the big clock. I think that one makes makes sense. I don't know. Uh, what else? Uh, the Madam Butterfly that I that San Diego Opera just did last year. Good. Sat it. It was in the little paper house on top of the hill, overlooking the bay. That's where it's supposed to be. That's not like the previous production, which was set the entire thing in the American Consulate office building. How that make the the wedding was there. The family showed up there. Did she she there? lives there, or she's visiting there. <laughs> yeah, she did. I guess she's visiting there when she and she. That's weird. She hides her son, you know, and brings him out. Well, from the waiting room, I, it it was just dumb. I, and the chorus was all Americans, American women and na- and naval officers, not the family. Makes no sense. No, that makes no sense. It at makes all. no sense. But I was in that production twice. I like the Navy officer uniform, though. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> but it made no sense. But it's not for me. It's not for the performer. The production is not for the performers. The production is for the audience. Right. That's how it should Apparently be. Apparently it's not. Apparently it's for the director. Yeah. You know, directors... We've gone through various ages in opera. You know, we had... The age of the the of the singer, you know, through the the first parts that we had, then Toscanini really led the led the way into the age of the conductor. Um, uh, we had the and, and at the Met, I mean, there have been various administrations from German to Italian to generically American to whatever it is now. Um, and, and then we've gone into the age of the director and 
the last time I checked, the 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 director doesn't have any lines, and no. doesn't sing anything. No. So why in the hell are they imposing themselves over, uh, get, getting away with imposing themselves over a performance in these ways? It's ridiculous. It, it is. is ridiculous. A distortion and and just so often absolutely without meaning. Yeah. And it, it's an age that needs to come to an end very, very badly. Very I badly. I agree. It started... If uh, you've got the best singers in the world for any given opera, nobody is going to even read the director's name. It's a matter of no importance whatsoever. No. You're in fact, to direct traffic the singers stage. will largely... It's, it's as if you think that the singers did not even read the libretto and have no idea what's happening. They can practically stage themselves. Yes. And this has been done. Singers walk in. I, I know uh, Domingo did it in, um, in, in London in uh, 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 Queen of Spades, Pique Dame, the Tchaikovsky. He flew in on a Wednesday and opened on Friday. He just staged himself. You know, he's just yeah. like, I'll tell you where I'm going to be when I sing this because I, I know what's going on. Yes. You know, where's that case? He's over there. Okay, I'm going to be over there. Um, and it's just, it's not Ibsen. It's not Shakespeare. It doesn't require, in fact, I wonder whether Ibsen and Shakespeare really require the services of a director. Yeah. You just generally don't. Right. A director's job is to get things up on legs put them in largely the right areas and make sure that nobody runs into each other and say, yeah, yep. okay, now do it. Now do it. Exactly. That's what a director yeah. is for. A director is not even needed to help with characterization because the music does the characterization. If the music doesn't do the characterization, as we, said, bad opera. <laughs> as we said in the other episode, it, it, no, it, nothing's going to help it. No amount of direction is going to help. Because the music is not doing its job. Right. Can't be helped. Nope. So where where is the importance of a, a director? And then a lot of times the director is directing a production maybe that they didn't, didn't have a hand in producing. So there is that element as well. You know, here, here's the, a good example. But it's usually a director who comes up with the production. Here's a good example. Yeah. In a Charlie Brown Christmas... Lucy enlists Charlie Brown to be the director of the Christmas pageant. And he says, all right, people, listen up. We're going to do this. And then the next thing, the music erupts and they're dancing around the stage, you know, like that. And guess what happens at the... So he goes off feeling dejected. And then he kills it. He kills over his little Christmas tree. And he goes off, oh, I killed it. And he wanders off. And the kid... The, the cast come around, and they fix it all up, and you get the Christmas tree, and they yeah. come back, and he says, well, he is a blockhead, but he did get a pretty good tree. <laughs> you know, that, that's about casting. There you go. And yeah. then... Which the director doesn't do. Which the director doesn't do, and then they yeah. come back, and you've got to play. There, there you go. Yeah. It's a Charlie Brown Christmas. <laughs> that's the director for you. Yeah. Like... Yep. You agree, huh? Okay. <laughs> you agree. Oh. So, no. Okay. So, I mean, there we are. The, the we we are in the age of a director, and it's going to come to an end when opera dies internationally, and then opera will be reborn in a more sensical way, one which which is, is has to respond to the to to principally to the public. Right. You know. Yeah. But and this, the public is the public. This phoenix is ready to to go back into the fire as ashes. Yeah. Yeah, it's really strange, man. Death and rebirth, Mahler's resurrection. You know, I mean, that, that's what it's all about. It has to happen. Or reforging the sword. Reforging the sword with a cardboard box and six that's, read. That's right. <laughs> with a you know, cardboard with a cardboard anvil yeah um but i mean this i don't is what we're we're lucky really in that we're coming out of this age of operatic development 
with so many resources, recordings, videos, yeah. you know, books, and, and uh, we've got so much to show how it works well. Right. That the hope is there for the future. There's just a few people that we have to send to Siberia to get them out of the way. Yeah. I think some of it, I don't want to call it cultural Marxism because that's not right. But the big issue for me with Karl Marx is he looked at capitalism, which had developed over centuries and had hundreds of thousands, if not millions of minds involved in the production of capitalism. And he said, I know better than all of that. <laughs> me, my, my, my one brain is, has but more I information. I figured it all out. I figured it out, something that no one else could figure out. And that's what the director who bucks opera tradition is saying. Oh, I don't care that opera has been around for 400 years. I don't care that it's developed itself in this way. I'm so clever. I know yes. what it should be. Absolutely. Because that was all part of the patriarchy and imperialism and colonialism and all the isms that we don't like. Well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe not. It's, or it could just be opera. Operaism. That's what it is. You know, I, I mean, it's as if they want to take a fable, which is a relatively simple. Are we going to get your purring? honor, Mike? Are we going to get purring in the microphone? Um, <laughs> it's as if they want to take a fable, which is a simple tale, mm -hmm. right? And 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 turn yeah. it into Tolstoy's War and Peace. Yeah, turn it into a, a or, or a Dickens' five season, Bleak House. A five season series. Yeah, it's not. That's for the writing about it afterwards. You just have to let it be what it is. Let it be simple. Let it be understood, and then make your extrapolations on paper. See, that's what writing's for. Hmm. Yeah, you know, and uh, and oh. that that's that has just dealt. So many. Yeah. When the director is trying to direct an audience toward a specific idea that the director has, that is egotism and it doesn't belong there. If the audience has a certain response to the archetypes within Wagner's Ring Cycle, great. You don't have to, the, no one should be doing that for them. It is based on ancient myths that have existed for a reason, because there's and something about And they need to go that, out and write about it. Yeah, you can go write about it, but don't put it on stage. Right? Yeah. You know, in, in a That's lot what, of... That's why they're not directors, they're commentators. In, in a lot of ways, what you're saying is that the director is trying to write his own review into the performance. Right. It, 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 therefore, it is undeniable how clever I am. Yes. There you go. There you go. That the, the, the review does not belong inside the performance. The review belongs outside, yeah. you know, in the journal. And directors want to, and it's, you know, it's like, it's like Gilbert uh, Savoyards, Gilbert and Sullivan's people who, who want to laugh at inside, you know, as, in their character. You can't do that. Mm -hmm. You've got to let the audience respond. It's right. their job to respond. Don't you respond. You're, you don't get to know you're funny. Otherwise, it it's becomes an inside joke. Yeah. And there's nothing less funny than an inside joke. It's true. So what so, was your poem? Oh, it's just seasonal, you know. Oh, seasonal. A seasonal poem. Oh. It's a little book called, uh, called The Friendly Town. Uh, a little <laughs> book for the urbane. By a friendly town com compiled by E. V. Lucas, um, who was a, a, a an English writer, and um, you know you you commented at the beginning that this is a book, and it, provided I can actually see the small print, I think there there's a couple of things here that are worth worth reading. This is a Lucas was an interesting character. He he was a compiler of 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 books of of minutia and miscellanies and and mainly to do with london and and england and uh um and he wrote a, quite a lot of books um of this nature and this was one that i picked up in london years ago 
And so this is the argument for this book. And you, you commented upon, that's a book. <laughs> the argument. When still in the season of sunshine and leisure, while blithe yet we wander o'er meadow and down, oh say, is it treason to think of the treasure heaped up for us yonder in grey London town? We hunt the sweet berry with purple-stained ardour, each bramble one hooks on is bent neath its load. It's free and it's merry in nature's rich larder, but, oh, to hunt books in the Charing Cross Road. As daylight expires in this best of Septembers, a coolness comes blowing, a chill wintry hint. But think, it blows fires in and dream kindling embers and candlelight glowing on time-mellowed print. The glory of summer one's being rejoices, yet hail to the flavor of summer's decay. It's bringing the glamour, the lights and the voices, the dear homely savor of London this way. I like that. I, like I think for, for a guy who was a compiler of books, that's a pretty good thing to include, you know, of your own creation as the argument for your book. It's nice. all about London. It's yeah. all about the homely, you know, yeah, it's great to get out in the countryside, but man, you know, just culture. Want to be a culture vulture yes. in Charing Cross Road going through the yes. stacks. Culture. I, I just love that poem, but oh, to hunt books in the Charing Cross Road. And I mean, I've been there. I what is to, the Charing Cross Road? Well, the Charing Cross Road goes from Trafalgar Square up to uh, Tottenham Court Road, where it intersects with Oxford Street and becomes Tottenham Court Road. And that's where the central London used booksellers are. Ah. Charing Cross Road uh, used to be just lined with used bookshops. There is still a few, I think. Mm. Um, so, Old October. Hail, old October, bright and chill, first freed man from the summer's sun. Spice high the bowl and drink your fill. Thank heaven at last the summer's done. Come, friend, my fire is burning bright. A fire's no longer out of place. How clear it glows. There's frost tonight. It looks white winter in the face. You've been to Richard. Ha <laughs> ha you've seen a noble play. I'm glad you went. But what on earth can Shakespeare mean by winter of our discontent? Be mine the tree that feeds the fire. Be mine the sun knows when to set. Be mine the months when friends desire to turn in here from cold and wet. The sentry sun that glared so long o'erhead deserts his summer post. Ah, you may brew it hot and strong, the joys of winter. Come, a toast. Shine on the kangaroo, thou sun. Make far New Zealand <laughs> faint with fear. Don't hurry back to spoil our fun. Thank goodness, old October's here. Thomas Constable. I like yes. it. Classical Rebellion is more than just classical music and opera. That's right. It's a, it's a way of life. It is a way of life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, yeah. so we're trying to share that life <laughs> with you. Get out there. Be a part of the conversation and join in the Classical, classical Rebellion. rebellion. Ha, ha, ha.